Hi, everybody. We've got about two, almost 30 people that have signed up for this um, tonight. So we'll just give everybody a, few, a minute or so left to, um, to get signed on, and then we'll go ahead and, and begin. All right. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. M my name is Jennifer Fimble, and I'm with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Office here in Dutchess County. I'm also the county's ag navigator. I work with municipal officials um, when it pertains to matters pertaining to agriculture. So I work with um, assessors and planning board members, uh, zoning, building code officers. So it, it really has been a great thing and this series of uh, Farming in Dutchess, uh, the virtual series put on by uh, Dutchess County Planning is also part of the um, Ag, uh, Dutchess County Ag Advisory Committee as well. Um, Soil and Water is part of that. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Lauren Drum. She's here from the Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District. Tonight's program is on regenerative farming and soil health. Uh, Lauren, you, I don't know if you wanna get on and say a few words about soil and water and then I can share screens with, so that you can go ahead and do your presentation. All right, Jen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. There <laughs> you go, yep. <laughs> um, so I'm Lauren Drum. I'm from Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, my job here is as um, environmental management technician for farming. Um, so we work a lot with the state and do some, we have some programs for people to help them with pasture management, um, offers for streamlines, um, trying to fence some, some animals out of water. Um, and we're going to go through a lot of that tonight. So I'm not going to go on about it right now. So. <laughs> hey, you should be able to share your screen. If you go down to the bottom middle where it says share screen, it should pop up. There you go. I think it's starting in the middle. I'm gonna ask all the participants to put any questions you have in the chat. And instead of interrupting Lauren, we'll go ahead and get to those at the end. Um, and then I'll go ahead and address those questions as we, um, towards the end of the program. Okay. Um, can everybody see the presentation? Is it up there? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. You, might want, you, might want, you might, might want to put it onto um, slideshow. Oh, it's on the. I think it's sharing the wrong one. <sighs> I have too many screens going on here. I need to get out of it. Mm.
Not on the right screen. So reduce that one and then pull up the other one that you have. If, if as long as it's on your screen, if you've already got it on your screen. Now go up, up do just a minimize button up there at the top. Bring that one down and then pull up the other one if it's on your screen already. No, same one. Yeah, it's on the it's on the wrong screen. <laughs> oh dear. Can you drag it over? Screens that I have. And you look like you're frozen. Hi, Lauren, this is Shelby Frank from Dutchess County Planning. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I just wanted to say, if it's easier, you um, on your other screen, if, if you're not able to drag it over, like Jen said, you could always email it to us. Um, you could email it to Jen or myself and we could share on your behalf if that's helpful. I just took all the screens off. Okay. Can you see it now? No. It's okay. You might just have to share your screen again. Okay. We're almost there. I can feel it. <laughs> you got this. There you go. We can tell I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> go to that one and then go to slideshow and it'll start from right from the beginning. Okay. Okay. There you go. Thanks, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so soil health, um, that just kind of soil and water conservation. Um, my program is Envi agricultural, agriculture environment management program. Um, we're just going to go through some basics of just general soil. Um, so that top layer is the humus and the top soil. That's where you're going to grow most of your crops, your grasses, all that fun stuff. And then you get to the subsoil, which doesn't really, a lot of roots don't reach down in there. Um, and then you got weathered rock and bedrock. There are some places where the bedrock is a little bit higher um, and it kind of fluctuates a little bit here and there. Your organic layer um, is a lot of your, your top plant matter um, and your top soil is where most of that stuff is gonna start growing with a good root system. Um, so the, the median for soil, it's a good habitat, habitat for organisms. Um, you know, a lot of us are trying to grow plants above the ground, but there's a lot of organisms below the surface. There's worms and bugs and all kinds of great things. Um, so people are worried about the cows on top of the soil, but what about the bugs underneath? You need to have all of that present in order to have good, healthy soil. Um, soil's a median for growing. It's a good water supply purification system, um, and it recycles nutrients and organisms, organi organic waste. Um, the big problem that we have with soil health is erosion. Erosion is the loss of soil particles due to the action of, of wind or water. Um, soil particles that deposit in undesirable places. So um, erosion is not just where you lose soil, but it's also where you're getting soil where you don't need it. Um, <clears throat> particles that deposit in undesirable places after many years is alluvial. So pretty basic stuff. Um, types of erosion are natural. So some erosion is natural. Uh, if you go through a forest where there's no human intervention or anything like that, there is soil disturbance, there is soil erosion. It's, it's a natural process. Um, but a lot of times we're accelerating it by inter intervening with um, ag processes or building houses and stuff like that. 
<clears throat> so a lot of our problems is urbanization, agriculture, industry, infrastructure, and tourism and recreation. They're all kind of depleting our soil health. We need to kind of go back and regenerate some of it. Um, happy trees are in the wind. <laughs> um, the erosion from wind is eotic. Erosion from water is hydric. Um, some soil particle information. There's a lot of soils in Dutchess County that are like clay loam. So they're a little heavier. Um, they're really great for holding water, but then once it starts to dry out, that clay really turns to almost concrete and it's very hard to use. <clears throat> um, there's, when you have clay and silt together, it gets a, a much better consistency where it still has a, a growing medium when it gets a little drier. Uh, when you get into sandy soils, it gets really drained easily and it's kind of hard to work with for the most part. Um, your soil sizes, your clay is tiny and then your silt is a little bigger and your sand particles are quite large. So your sand particles are the ones that are gonna move, are gonna cause the most damage when they move, but it's also gonna take a lot more to move them. Um, clay is easier to move once it's separated from each other. A um, little bit of rock fragments. A, bold, a lot of people think boulders are huge, but really it's 25 inches or above is actually considered a boulder. Um, stones 10 to 25 and so on. <clears throat> um, so effects of erosion, these are kind of what we try to slow down with my office is water contamination, land fragmentation, the sedimentation in rivers. Um, so you're not just losing your soil on your property, it's going to other people's property and staying there and it kind of causes problems for them as well. So you're losing some of that soil, they're gaining some soil and it's not really, it's not a good situation for either person. Um, so trying to keep it in place as much as possible is what we're trying to do. Um, causes damage to buildings and lots of flooding. Um, it causes a loss of habitat. So when you have heavy rain events and there's um, a lot of movement of, of that top layer of soil, you're losing habitat for those bugs and worms. You're also losing um, more habitat for even um, birds and fish and stuff like that, because as things move, it creates a bigger problem. Um, potential of accidents, loss of income. When you lose that topsoil, you lose the best part of the, the soil, so you lose income on it. Um, reduction for the production of food, increase in the, in the cost for, to fix it. So um, geomorphic processes linked to the movement of water, saturation, separation, transportation, dep deposition. Um, so water erosion, um, when that soil is not held together well by some kind of uh, organic matter, grasses, um, trees, shrubs, anything like that, it hits and it kind of separates it apart. Um, and then you can kind of see in the bottom right corner, all the little pieces are moving down. Wind, it kind of more skips away. Your small, smaller particles, like your clay, when it separates, it's gonna kind of go into the wind. Your bigger particles, like your sands, are gonna creep along the, the ground. Um, but it's still gonna move pretty good distances. Um, so the, the more ground cover you have, the less soil loss you have, kind of what this kind of depicts. So influence vegetation on the soil, it protects against traffic, increases absorption and accumulation of nutrients. It intercepts water, so it kind of slows down the water before it takes it away um, and increases the filtration, stores it. Um, so the more vegetation you have on the ground, the more infiltration you'll have in the soil and the better it will store it. So when you do go through a, a drought period, the drought won't affect you as long or as hard because you'll have that water holding capacity in your soil. And it ties up particles. 
um, it's harder to move these particles if they're held together by different types of vegetation. Um, so now we're gonna get into a couple of projects that we've done. I'm gonna try and get this to open up a video that we did last year. Um, three of the big projects that we've done are for the carb carbon sequestration grant. Um, so Chase Home Farm does rotational grazing. They're trying to build the organic matter. Um, so they did some cover crops and bale grazing. Um, and then Willowbrook did a repairing and buffer. We fenced out a, a stream for them. Um, I'm gonna try and get this to open up. It's probably gonna mess everything else up on it. <laughs> Grass your cows. Uh, I'm Sarah Chase from Chase on the Farm, a third generation dairy farmer, but I'm 100% grass fed, organic, we practice rotational grazing, uh, holistic management. We're managing on our home farm 220 acres. With about at this point, 75 cows. The, the first benefits that you notice when you are occasionally grazing is that you know that you're going to have grass for your cows. Uh, in a continuous grazing system, the grass can't be over the cows. In the prescribed grazing, where you're setting up where the cows can and can't go, they only have access to what you give them. So they do a clean job, taking out all those plants that are the same, and then that zone can let you grow and you can count on that grass to come back. We started grazing taller, not turning them into it until the grass was off the had the first grazing. And that way we were able to control the amount of energy the cows were getting. It's like they're not only getting protein from this lush grass, which is generally down lower on the plant, they're getting to eat this like higher energy on top of the plant. Um, you know, photosynthesizing like very green active forage. And you can take them out to make sure they don't go down and below like a, maybe a six inch residual. Leaving more um, residual helps the plant grow back faster. Carbon is sequestered by the plant photosynthesizing and sending carbon dioxide down into the soil where it is traded with the microbes and through the roots, through the exudates. We're trying to encourage that relationship to happen more and more and more. So I will graze the pasture and mow it down so that the grass is small at the end of the fall when, when those perennial plants are starting to like cool it a little bit and prepare for winter. And then I will no-till into that sod a heavy rye mix. These have grasses, legumes, and forbs in there. And in the spring, those plants are going to grow up and mow it down so that they're not going to come back after you know we do the first cutting out of the field. They're just they're plants that are like there to contribute to the networks in the soil. We call our system not just like rotational grazing, but I call it adaptive plant grazing because it feels really important that the grass managers are responding to weather events. You know, each season is different. How much rain are we getting? How hot is it? How many cows do you have on the pasture? All of those factors are going to change the way you should be grazing at a certain time. This grazing strategy gives you more resilience. It's part of the tool set for you know, managing a forage-based farm in a time when climate change is like causing all sorts of chaos and the way that we were used to doing things. It does take a real change in management style. That means like spending a lot more human presence, setting up fences, taking down fences. It means like designing your farm in a different way. But besides the like time and learning, there's not a ton of investment. And I think that it like really does pay dividends long term for farm health, animal health, and you know in our case, both of milk and, and quality. I would absolutely endorse some 
version that works for you of an examinated grazing plan. The hills of Tomorrow's and Marin County are mm -hmm. breathtaking. Lauren, on the next one, try turning up your volume on that video. It's very hard to hear. Oh, okay. All right. And um, it may not come through because because it's unstable um, internet or something that's causing it to be run really slowly okay. on, a video, on a video chat. But that's okay because you'll be able to send us, I think, the links. And then we can send that out to everybody as well, if that's okay. Yep. We'll give it a try. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Hopefully this loads. Our farm is a Willowbrook farm. It's been here since 1943, our third generation, and uh, we've been uh, doing fire uh, ever since. We have a big waterway that goes through our farm. We have a huge stream bed. The beginning of our swamp is the, is the aquifer that runs into the Tuck Creek, goes over to the tomorrow and then just the uh, river. The buffer that we're doing uh, is in our pasture. We have the fence uh, for the streamline to keep the cows close, but the cows are running through the bed and, and going to the bathroom in the stream and, and polluting it with nitrates, phosphorus, um, and so on. That's all complete. And this week we're going to start doing other stuff. So plant fruit trees, the bushes to clean the carbon out of the air, take the nitrates out of the water, filter it, clean the roundup. Hopefully by next year we'll have some fruit growing, which means that we're growing. And um, we've got a fruit from that also for our farm site. Before the project started to reclaim the stream bed, we had a group of peppers down there, and they all just traveled through the streams. The traffic of the animals went through the water, it made it really muddy. So the pasture was always muddy, the cows weren't as clean, and by keeping them out of the stream bed, um, it was actually dried out part of the pasture. There's minimal maintenance on what we're doing. Uh, once the defense is up, it's just uh, basic mowing, and then the cows can do the rest. On a uh, cost level, we haven't had to put out any money. We've worked with Spring Water Conservation um, for many years. This is uh, a step one of the uh, next five or six years, I hope, projects. And hopefully it will benefit and uh, make up for more efficient, which is uh, the most important thing to keep us going. We are still doing any sort of uh, government uh, programs um, to explore our best don't be afraid to ask any friend that's involved, including myself. The best way to reach out is to be a friend on the website to your, your local uh, water use conservation office. By uh, using these programs that the Swimming Water offers, uh, we can better everything that we use on the farm um, and make it a better place for my kids. Uh, so uh, maybe someday that they want to be able to, to be a first generation farmer. By protecting the land that we, we work every day. That's something that means a lot to me. Yeah, that's the Okay, so if you couldn't hear that, then I'll make sure that you guys get the. The yeah, two. that one. No, um, that one was actually even worse. So I'm not oh. quite sure why. Yeah, so it wasn't. It's not you. And and for those of you who are on, you know, these are really well worth watching and listening to. Maybe just give a brief overview of what you were doing. 
um, in those videos. And I think, and then you can move on from there. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I have pictures of like before and afters for both programs, um, but those were really cool videos to kind of get an idea of how the farmers feel on things as well. Um, so I was hoping they would work, but best laid plans don't always work. <laughs> um, so a little bit more on Willow Brooks. Uh, the top picture is before we put the fence in. It doesn't look terrible. There's a lot of like weeds, but you can see where the cows kind of entered that stream. They would stand in it. It's kind of mucky. Um, it comes right off the barn. So uh, the bottom picture is right after we put the fence up. Um, so it was a, a completion of the fence picture kind of a thing. So there's still a lot of wear and tear on that stream. Uh, it hasn't had a chance to, to regenerate any of the grasses or anything around it. Um, so we went, we've been out to Willowbrook so many times. The bottom picture was like winter time. Um, he had some sheep grazing in that front pen there. Um, uh, it, it's just, it's not a good situation. And then during the, the spring and summer, it's a little more green, but he did have cattle kind of like walking in and out and you can see the drainage coming off of the barn. Um, you, you know what's going into that stream coming out of the barn. Um, so here is some pictures of the buffer when we implemented it. Um, the bottom picture is that front part of the stream. So we fenced off the barn. It's not a whole huge area right there, but you can still see where it's starting to green up. All of the flags are where we planted um, shrubs and trees. The pink flags are the trees, the, the greenish yellowy flags, um, well, greenish flags are the shrubs that we put in. Um, so you can see how many we put in. I think there was 770 plants that we put at Willowbrook last year. Um, the bottom right corner, you can see the fence line. The fence was put in a year before the shrubs were. Um, so that's a year of regeneration where you can see that it's already starting to fill in with grasses. It's becoming healthier. The stream is already doing better than it was the year before. Um, so the point of this was to pretty much just buffer that stream from all of that manure and sediment and everything else coming out of the barn. Um, I went out there last week and this is, um, unfortunately some farmers don't have time to, to maintain a whole lot. So, there, but there's grasses, there's shrubs, there's trees. Um, you can see how vegetated the water is. Uh, the more vegetated the water is, the more shaded it is, the more healthy it is for, for fish and for bugs. Um, it's created a whole new habitat for um, birds and wildlife. Some of the shrubs have been lost to the, the weeds that kind of grew up, um, but it's still, it's doing its job. It's, it's filtering into the stream. So not as much manure and sediment and erosion is happening around the, and it's a DEC stream. So it's a, a regulated stream water course. Um, Chase Farm, we did two projects for, for Sarah up there at Chase Home. Uh, this one is a picture of a cover crop. Um, so the one on the right actually is more weedy. Um, before she put the cover crop in and then this, the spring after the fall seeding is on the left. It doesn't look like a lot, but it is early spring. Um, I forgot to get pictures when I went out there last week, but it's very lush, it's very green, it's very healthy. It's got all kinds of stuff that the cows really like to eat. Plus um, compaction has reduced. So we have a penetrometer, it kind of measures how much compaction there is in the fields. So when I went out before the, the she did a, I wanna say a 10 species cover crop. So there was a little bit of everything in this cover crop. Um, most people do one or two, sometimes three. Uh, Sarah likes to, to work with all kinds of different things and try new stuff. So she did like the biggest multi-species cover crop that she could. <laughs> um, and it's working for her, the cows like it, it's regenerating the, the soil. And it's actually creating a lot more um, organic matter on the top of the ground as well. Um, she did intensive bale grazing through the winter. This hillside, you can see all the bales on the hillside. Um, it was it, very rocky, very rough. There wasn't a whole lot of organic matter, not a whole lot of topsoil. Um, so we, we did a bale grazing program, put out a ton of bales, as you can see in that top picture. <laughs> um, the cows were out there on and off all winter. 
grazing through rain, snow, everything else. Um, and then in spring, you can still see where they, they roughed it up quite a bit. Um, but here's where it's starting to green up in those brown areas where the bales were, there's a lot of manure, there's a lot of leftover hay, but there's also some green coming through in little spots. If you look closely, um, it's rejuvenating the soil a lot better. There's a lot more organic matter. There's a lot more topsoil being built up. And it's actually, two, this is two years ago. This year, I went out there last week and once again, the compaction is down. There's much more organic matter growing. There's much more grasses. It's much healthier. And I think that it did its job. Um, the third project that we did through the carbon sequestration grant uh, was with Stony Kill. Um, so when we first went out there, the top picture was the cows grazing right after we started the, the process of separating out their field. They have one, I think it's a 10 acre field, 10 or 12 acre field. Um, we figured out a way to, to put an alleyway in to get the animals to each of the different sections. And I think they're using three sections right now um, to rejuvenate different sections at a time. Uh, this summer was a little rough for every farmer because it got so dry. But once again, I was out there last week, the compaction is almost non-existent at this point. I couldn't um, think, yeah. So that was my penetrometer that is, you know, two feet long and it just, it went all the way down every time. <laughs> so kind of shows you that it started out a little rough and I, I was getting like, I was getting to like eight inches and it was stopping for the, the compaction. And now it's going all the way down to 24 with, without a problem and 24 inches without a problem. And I think uh, the, the rotational grazing did a lot better for this farm as well. Um, they had forage throughout the year, even with the drought. Uh, and the, the animals look pretty healthy and happy. And they're also rotating uh, sheep and cows together. Um, to go on to a couple other problems that we've encountered on other farms, this is you know a traditional cornfield with a, a one foot ditch that went through it because the water just cut through it. Um, there's a couple of different reasons why this happens with soil erosion. It could be because there's a, a waterway that needs to be fixed with a diversion um, to cut down the water that's cutting across that cornfield. Maybe it needs to come out of corn and go into hay for a few extra years. Um, but we can help you figure all of that out too. Uh, we can do what we call Russell runs to see what the, the proper um, rotation of crop and hay, of corn and hay and soybeans and all of that should be to rejuvenate the soil on a regular basis. Um, here's some more traditional corn fields, um, sometimes runoff from roads do real bad damage because that corn doesn't really help in um, on the one side and then the roads just running off on the other side. You have to create an actual ditch to go down and, and divert the water, um, stabilize the ditch. Uh, sometimes it's a waterway with grass and sometimes it's rock line, um, but it's all something that we can help figure out with you. The one on the the picture on the left is actually through the middle of the same crop field. So they needed a diversion to come across the middle of the field and cut the amount that goes down the hill. So there's a couple different problems in that field. Um, when you're looking at different pastures, uh, uh, horses can do some of the most damage to the pastures because of their foot base um, is so wide and flat and causes them a, a lot of compaction to soil. Um, a lot of horse farms don't have enough pasture to create good soil health. So the, the most you can do is try to rest and rotate and get that grass to grow before letting the horses out there. And the, the more you can get them to rotate, the more forage you can get to grow in there, uh, the better off that soil is gonna be. And this huge ditch might not happen. Um, I think this water was actually coming off of a hillside going straight through this big field and we had to divert the water away from the field. Uh, this can actually become dangerous for horses um, because they're not always the smartest animals when you let them out in a field. <laughs> um, so this one, there was a diversion that was in place, but like a lot of things, there's a lifespan to it. 
Um, so the, the diversion actually broke. This is a few years ago. There was a heavy rainstorm um, and the diversion broke and, and took out a pretty good swath of corn in that field. So we had to redo the, the drainage on that field with a new diversion. Um, and this is all different things that soil health really will help prevent. Uh, I think this, is, this was a continuous cornfield. So taking that corn out, putting it back into some kind of grass, alfalfa, something like that's gonna build up that organic matter, build up that soil health in it, um, and put some nutrients back into the ground and make it happier, will help it too. Um, hydro seeding, so we do some municipalities, um, some hydro seeding. Um, it, it puts a layer over that ground, so uh, it's mulch and grass seed, uh, so it holds it together a little bit quicker for you. This is a waterway with a pasture and a crop field. Um, there's not much of a buffer to it. So adding some more shrubs along that is going to protect it from any of the runoff that's coming off of those fields. Uh, there's a big problem with, you know, having these fields right up to the streams. Some people need to use streams for, the, for access to water. Uh, this one, the cows are up there. I think there's a pond up in that field as well where the cows are accessing water. We can try and find grants and different ways to fund uh, water for, for pastures as well. Um, so to get the cows away from that water, buffer it because it's, it's, you know, soil health and water health are kind of, you know, all in the same game. <laughs> um, putting some more shrubs up there, protecting that soil, protecting that water, it's all the same stuff. Um, cover crops. So the, the right side, is winter rye. It was a cornfield. Um, the farmer put in winter rye and it looks pretty good. The left side is an alfalfa mix. So it's continuous alfalfa for up to five or six years, depending on the farm and how their alfalfa is growing. Uh, this one, you know, it's, it's coming back. I think this was in the spring. So the rye came back a lot greener and thicker. This farm will probably, um, kill the cover crop and then plant in corn again, but it builds that soil health because that, that crop has just put in nutrients, it's put in organic matter, it's put in, it's, it's held the soil together through the winter um, and the alfalfa did the same thing. Uh, so some of the projects that we can help, uh, cover crops, pasture management, crop rotations, uh, all kinds of buffers, reforestation projects, uh, we do soil health testing with nutrient management and uh, exclusion fence. So if you don't have a good fence to, to put along your stream, waterway, um, pond, we can help you uh, get some exclusion fence, get your animals out of there, and then get you other access to water. <clears throat> some of the ways that we can help is uh, there's a climate, climate resiliency grants that are available through the state. Uh, Non-point source grants also available through the state. We in this office have mini grant systems where we can put up exclusion fence. So we do buffers and we also have a buffer, buffer initiative. So if you don't actually have um, a farm, but you do have you know, water on your property and you wanna put tree, shrubs and trees in, uh, we can help with that as well. Uh, rotational grazing systems and a uh, nutrient management. And then NRCS has uh, some different forms of funding to help people out as well. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. There's, there's not any questions in the chat. So at this point, if you do have a question, you can unmute and go ahead and ask it. Um, so I think, Lauren, people get confused at like, the, the idea of regenerative farming is new. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really not. No. <laughs> um, it's the same stuff that we've kind of been doing. Um, some farmers are better at it than others. Um, a lot of people, the regenerative farming like might be a rotational grazing system instead of throwing the animals out into a big pasture. Uh, that's kind of the difference that we're working towards at this point, I think. 
Thank you. I think that, that I think that, that clears it up for, I think, a lot of people. Um, you know, I hear that all the time, like it's a new buzzword and it really is, the idea is not new at all. No, it's, it's the buzzword really, but it's, uh, farmers have always been, you know, great stewards of the land and they've always tried to figure out the best way to do it. And now everyone thinks, oh, regenerative farming, it's, it's a good term. <laughs> um, but I think with, they've all been doing it forever. So they're finding better ways to do it every day though. Well, and that's where you come in, it's your technical expertise. Yeah, I try. <laughs> yep, this is Tim here from Stony Kill, and I just am amazed at like the two years that we were doing the rotational grazing that you saw that that improvement. And also I felt it was surprising because of the drought this year. I, you know, I, I was worried about that. So it was just shows that, you know, putting that rotational grazing really increased the field. And I'm amazed at how quickly that that happened. Yeah, when I was out there last week, the the soil was just healthy because um, I pulled out this uh, the Cornell Soil Health Lab samples. Um, so I had you know a a bucket full of dirt <laughs> from the field, and it was healthy. It was it was wet. It was um, had a lot of worms in it. It was uncompacted. You know, the the penetrometer really worked on it. So, and with the rotational grazing, we are able to keep them out of an area that kind of really was affected by the drought so they weren't on that piece at all and they were kind of more in the more wetter area that was still kind of growing even during the drought so uh, it, I think that helped us manage the livestock and where they were so it was okay. great I'm glad it helped out <laughs> I have a question hello yep um I'm not a, I live across from a farm, 250 acres, and the farmer, um, it's owned by somebody else, but he rents the property, mm -hmm. and he, his cows always get out all the time on the road, and there's a stream, and our well is an under, under the ground spring, that's our well is only 50 feet deep, so if those cows are just running ragged because they're all over the place, they're in the stream, they're out, that's, that could be contaminating the water, possibly. That is my spring underneath or my neighbors, which is directly in front of that field. Mm -hmm. So um, like, Depends on yeah. how much vegetation there is, correct? Well, it was, it was a, I mean, it was a farm from Kessman Farms years, you know, I don't know how many years ago, all, you know, it was always corn. And then, then they stopped and then it became, um, I guess, just a barren piece of land. And now this guy puts cows on it. There's about 15 of them. And they, one, they're, because of the drought, they're getting loose and they're trying to find water and when, and because the stream went dry and they're trying to find water any way they can so they've been walking up the road they were on my front yard they were in my neighbor's backyard I mean they're and I I don't I mean there's I don't know if they're even getting good enough like they certainly don't rotate I mean that's for sure and down the road he's got other cows that are in a I don't know if you've ever heard because you're from Millbrook Thews apple orchards well, they're on Clap Hill Road and he has all his black Angus in the orchard and they don't rotate. They don't rotate those cows. They don't, I don't know what the heck they do, but it's, it's, um, I think it's a little problem. I guess I, I didn't realize that, that it needs to be rotated because obviously those cows are, they don't have anything to eat because there was a drought. The guy didn't, he didn't rotate them or anything. Yeah, um, some farmers are better stewards of the land than others. Um, and you, you hope that people try to do the right thing for, for the land and for the animals. And sometimes it doesn't work out that way. I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how affected your well would be. You can take a, a test um, yeah. and, and test it for, you know, fecal matter or anything like that if you really wanted to. Um, but it's still, it's 50 feet down. So it does still have to go through quite a bit of soil 
if yeah. it was vacant for a, a while, um, the soil health could still be decent in there. So, I mean, it's a... Well, the house was, this house that we had was vacant for two years, so it, it needed an ultraviolet light. Okay. Okay, so um, we, we haven't had that since though. We, we, okay. Hopefully, I should get it tested every now and then. Okay, it, it, sorry it, to, huh? If you have any more questions, you feel free to, to give me a call. We can yeah. try and set something up and take a look for you. Okay, thanks so much. No problem. And, and we're not here to tell farmers what they have to do. We're here to help them to do things that if they want to, to, to do things a little bit differently than they have been. Um, most farmers are, are open to that idea. Some don't have the money to implement some of those things. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you may think that the, those cows maybe have, don't have any access to water, but they may have access to, you know, twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, um, that they actually bring them. So, you know, before you make that kind of judgment call, um, maybe talk to your, your neighbor farmer and, oh, you know, no, I have, I have, okay. I mean, he, he doesn't, um, everybody on the road has called them because they're, they're usually, if they went to my neighbor's house at two 30 in the morning, they thought it was a stampede. I mean, and they're, they're down another road. I mean, unfortunately, you know, one of, I mean, I understand I, that Lou probably does not have a lot of cash, but he, it does, it's 250 acres and he's only putting them in one field and he rents the whole farm. So I, you know, I don't know, but he, you know, I, I know he's trying his best. He, I just was wondering about the, the water actually. That's, more the water. I mean, one of these days, a cow a car is going to probably hit a cow. Unfortunately, something will happen. But. I mean, we do try to find ways to help farmers who don't have enough money to, to implement things to help them um, create better habitats for the animals and everything else. Uh, if the farmers are willing to talk to us, we're not regulatory, so I can't go there and make anybody do anything. Yeah. Uh, so if you talk to him, we're like, hey, give Lauren a call. <laughs> give Jen uh, a I'll tell him. Yeah, and we'll try to, to work out the best way possible. I, I completely understand that farmers don't have money these days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so he does. Most economical, we try to help them out. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. Any other questions? That's actually a really good discussion, I think. Saying none, um, so what will happen next is that we will, and I've only got three dogs sitting in my lap right now, while otherwise I'd have my camera on. Um, let's see if I can do that without seeing, but no, you don't see any dogs. Um, so what we'll do next is I get the, the recording converted to our YouTube channel, and then I send that to Shelby, the link to Shelby at planning, um, and then they'll put it up on the um, planning department's website for the county. And you'll get an email with that so that you have a link to the actual recording once that's done. It does gonna it does take a day or a couple of days for us to get that done. Uh, it depends on on staff time. I don't have the the capabilities to do that. I don't have the passwords to go ahead and just convert it myself. So I have to rely on somebody else. But you will get a copy of the recording. We do not offer on continuing ed credits, but if you would like something for your organization that says that you attended this evening's program, um, just send me an email at JLF, that's in, F is in Frank, 20 at cornell.edu. And we, you know, I can get that, you know, an email to you so you can give that to whoever you work for if they if they will give you credits. We do not offer those credits. Um, so that should be it. And I, Lauren, will, along with that, Lauren will send um, either Shelby or myself the, uh, the links to those two YouTube videos about the farms. They really are worth the time to watch and, and they're excellently done. So um, I, I urge you to look at those when you have time. Um, Tim Stanley says, thanks, Lauren. Awesome information. So I thank you. And if there's no other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and close for tonight. Thank you, Lauren. Give me a call. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you so much.